Thanks a lot, Michael. Hey, folks, nice to be with you. Great to be back in Hawaii, the center of military strength in the Pacific. And uh, almost two years ago, uh, the nation acknowledged that we needed to pay more attention to what was going on in Asia Pacific. So uh, it seemed reasonable that we would come here uh, to have an activity such as this, and this is now the second, uh, second year. We were very pleased with the intellectual content of last year's uh, symposium, and uh, so here we are again. We're going to be discussing land power, defined as, uh, actually in broad terms, uh, defined as involving the United States Army, the U.S. Marine Corps, and the Special Operating Forces, and equivalent forces of other nations, uh, many of whom are represented in this room. The U.S. Army, as you know, has been in the Pacific for well over 100 years, and it's a rich and storied tradition beginning certainly with uh, our arrival here in, the Philippine, in uh, Hawaii, uh, but then the Philippines, China, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Cold War, and points in, in between. And this region has produced great victories and great challenges. And I'm not going to list all the challenges or, or the victories, but some of the challenges were profound. The challenge of distance, uh, the tyranny of distance, and uh, supplying the forces wherever they were in the jungles of New Guinea, Burma, the islands, the Philippines, Okinawa, and on and on and on. Uh, and it still is a challenge uh, today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. And now, once again, we are reminded of the importance of uh, the Asia-Pacific region and, uh, and the challenges which we face. Six of the largest land armies in the world belong to countries in this region, along with four nuclear powers, China, U.S., India, and North Korea and two others that border the region, Russia and Pakistan. 21 and 27 chiefs of defense, or their equivalents, are army officers. And the United States has approximately 106,000 U.S. Army soldiers and 11,000 Army civilians uh, based in this region or earmarked to support Admiral Locklear and uh, Pacific Command. It's an economic powerhouse, and you only have to see the ships uh, pulling into ports in the United States, both on the West Coast and East Coast and the Gulf ports. Huge, huge ships that are causing uh, the Veronzano Bridge to be raised uh, in height to accommodate. Uh, it's very important to American uh, trade. And nations in the Pacific and Asia region represent some of the most developed in the world to some of the least developed. It's also a region fraught with national disasters, natural disasters, as you know, and national disasters, as far as that goes. Japan's 2011 uh, tsunami and nuclear catastrophe and last year's typhoon, Haiyan in the Philippines are but two examples. And stability operations and uh, relationships, buildings, and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief are increasingly important. To that end, we have developed panels here, which we will uh, introduce uh, the next two and a half days. Uh, and uh, while LANPAC is new, there is no other similar, similar forum in the region that we know of that highlights land forces, the role of land forces in the Pacific. And we want to grow this and make it a premier activity of its kind in the region. Admiral Locklear's team in Pacific Command deserves thanks for this, as well as General Brooks and his uh, folks at U.S. Army Pacific. And we appreciate very much uh, all the work that uh, General Brooks personally and his team have uh, put into this activity. Component commands MAR-4PAC, SOC-PAC, PAC-GAF, PAC-FLEET, 
our great partners here in this conference as well as partners throughout the region. And many of our industry partners, not all, are represented in the uh, room to my right, your left. And we have international officers and delegations from throughout the region, academic institutions, and the greater Honolulu uh, community, business community. And I would like all of you to remember as this continues, the role uh, that land power plays in the Pacific region and indeed throughout the world. And pay attention to what you're seeing uh, with the Russian army. This is an ad lib I'm going to give you, but if you're watching TV, the Russian army that we're seeing today in, uh, in and around Ukraine and Crimea is much different than the Russian army that I saw in the early 90s as I traveled throughout Russia. This is a disciplined, changed army. And just as uh, people saw at Gettysburg, the, uh, the Union Army that started the Civil War changed, changed profoundly. And it changed the nature of the war the last year and a half of the American Civil War. Armies change. Pay attention to what we're seeing with that army. This is not amateur sport. And remember, Russia is an Asian country. So anyway, now let me just make a couple of, give you a couple of thoughts. Our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen are magnificent, and their families remain remarkably supportive. And our veterans and retirees are committed. But this budgetary phenomenon known as uh, sequestration is really causing everybody uh, big problems. Um, I did some work yesterday, and I, for one, am worried about the fact that we're no longer making uh, or producing the C-17. The line hasn't gone cold, but uh, we're actually building planes for other countries. The C-17 is critical to movement in the Pacific as well as uh, ships in the reserve fleet. Sequestration, which uh, will hit the Department of Defense for 50 percent of the uh, debt reduction program of the United States, will kick in again in fiscal uh, 16 and run through 2022. The Department of Defense only receives 17 percent of the federal budget, yet we are contributing 50 percent. And it's essentially government by robot. Now, we saw some breaks in that with uh, this uh, Ryan Murray bill, which were very important because that loosened some money up and enabled people in Congress to make decisions based on the needs of the country rather than on some program that was established before we saw some of the changes which we have seen in the world. Now let me tell you what sequestration will mean in the Pacific. The ships in the reserve fleet deploy U.S. forces to the Pacific and can be available to load within five days at non-sequestration funding levels. However, when sequestration kicks in, that time extends out to 20 or more days. In other words, the ships won't be at the West Coast ports or whatever other ports they go to, Galveston or wherever. Instead of five days, it'll be 20 days. And the vast distances of locations like Korea with a normal time of transit of 14 days, two weeks, would kick out uh, considerably uh, when you add in the 20 days just to get the ships to the port. Could be over 30 days of transit times. Uh, obviously, the air fleet is woefully under-resourced in the Pacific and to maintain readiness of the airlift and air refueling aircraft, C-17s, KC-10s, and the like, are also threatened by sequestration. Now, the reason I'm making a point of this is that uh, we're working the action to see what we can do 
to uh, either change or eliminate sequestration. And uh, this is an effort worthy of a lot of effort. And if any of you, this is, you know, you can do what you want to do, but anybody that wants to uh, talk to their elected officials is certainly welcome to do so. Uh, but you need to know that we, myself, I'm going to testify on it, and some of my people are going to testify on it. I think it's uh, really the wrong thing for the United States of America to be doing at this time, and it's time for us to uh, speak up on it, and uh, we will do so. Now, I want to thank once again General Brooks and his people for, uh, for what they've done uh, to make this possible, and I also want to acknowledge the officers from other countries who are either assigned here in uh, Hawaii, uh, assigned and in part of members of uh, the various commands represented here. And I want to welcome the general officers and senior officers from many of the countries represented who, who live and work and uh, serve in their countries throughout the Asia Pacific uh, region. And I want to thank you all for being with us. Uh, now, last night, I had occasion to go to a small reception, and uh, I was quite surprised while I was there to receive a letter from the Daniel K. Inouye Institute. As many of you know, uh, Senator Inouye, a Medal of Honor recipient from World War II in the 442nd Infantry, um, and I quote, he was a longtime supporter of uh, people like us, people who serve. By the way, I never went to see him as the chief of staff of the Army that he didn't uh, have on his infantry blue tie with his cross rifles. And he always was very proud to show me that. He'd say, see, Chief, I didn't forget. Uh, now, I'd see him every once in a while. He didn't have it on because he didn't know he was, would see me. And he always apologized. He said, I'm sorry if I knew you uh, were going to be here. I would have put on my infantry tie. What a guy. So anyway, the story, this is the letter. The story of Dan Inouye is the story of modern Hawaii and the story of the promise of America. On behalf of the Daniel K. Inouye Institute Fund, we are pleased to share with you and the Association of the United States Army, a wooden bowl, the Hawaii chapter of the Association of the United States Army presented to the Senator in 1977, which I am holding in my hand here. This gift is a small token of his long-standing friendship and working relationship with the Association over many years. And goes on to say, uh, they hope we'll display it, which we will. And, uh, and it's a friendly reminder of his memory. His life's work can be captured in two simple words, freedom and fairness. Freedom and fairness. If you think about what was going on when he enlisted in the United States Army to people from his background, and how those men fought courageously throughout Italy and France. And he came back grievously wounded and went on to serve his country for the remainder of his life. He represents what is great about the United States of America. And frankly, I was very proud and touched to receive this simple wooden bowl and to think what this represents about the United States of America and people who are willing to stand up for freedom regardless the cost. So anyway, troops, thanks for being here. We're proud of you, and we will fight the fight to see if we can't change what sequestration is doing to you out here in the field as you try to move your piece of the world forward 
for your country, whatever that country may be, and certainly for those in the United States of America wearing the uniform or serving the United States, thanks for what you do for everybody in our country. God bless all of you. Okay, now, let's, um, I'm gonna bring General Brooks up and give him an opportunity to give us some of his thoughts. And how about welcoming uh, General Vince Brooks, the commanding general of U.S. Army Pacific, to the podium.